Measuring instruments play a fundamental role in the machine shop to determine the size and accuracy of both off-the-shelf and custom manufactured components. Today, we'll learn how to use various types of measurement instruments. Let's take a look at the lesson objectives. By the end of this video, students will be able to measure parts using steel rules, measure parts using various types of calipers, measure parts using micrometers, understand English and metric units. There are two common measurement systems used in the world, English and metric. The English scale is used almost exclusively in the United States, while most of the rest of the world uses metric. Engineers and machinists must be able to use both, as both are used in the United States. Each system has its own base set of units. In metric, it's meters. Meters are then subdivided into a hundred equal parts to form centimeters, and each of those is subdivided into ten parts called millimeters. In English, the units are inches. Twelve of those equals one foot. Three feet equals one yard. Smaller units of measure comes from subdividing inches into small fractions. Steel rules are useful for measuring objects that are longer than can be measured with a micrometer or caliper. Let's take a look at a few different steel rules. This one features 1 32nd divisions on this side, while it features 1 10th divisions on this side. This steel rule measures in centimeters as its primary divisions, and millimeters as its smaller divisions. This steel rule measures in inches, with a very fine 1 64th increment on this side of the scale, and a slightly easier to read 1 32nd division on this side of the scale. This steel rule is broken into decimal, with tenths of an inch as its major divisions. This side also features tenths as its major divisions, but you'll notice the scale here is finer than the scale on this side. The scale on this side is broken into twenty thousandths divisions, whereas the scale on this side is broken into ten thousandths divisions. Let's take a closer look at each. It's important to select a steel rule with fine enough graduations for the measurement precision desired, but not with graduations so fine that it's difficult to read. This steel rule measures in centimeters. Between the 17 and 18 mark is a measurement of one centimeter. Each centimeter is broken into millimeters. There are 10 millimeters as minor divisions for every one centimeter. This steel rule features a decimal scale that is broken into ten major divisions. Each major division is further broken into five smaller divisions. Each major division is equal to one-tenth of an inch, or 0.1 inches. Each of the smallest divisions is equal to 0 0.020, or twenty thousandths of an inch. In other words, one-fifth of one-tenth of one inch. The opposite edge of the steel rule features even finer graduations, in fact, twice as fine. The scale is very difficult to read, because its graduations are only ten thousandths of an inch apart. To read a scale this fine, it's often helpful to close one eye. This side of the steel rule features a fractional scale. Each major division is equal to one-eighth of an inch. Four thirty-seconds is equal to one-eighth of an inch. Each major division is broken into four subdivisions, each equal to one thirty-second of an inch. So this side of the steel rule is labeled in thirty seconds because there's a total of thirty-two minor divisions between the seven and eight inch marks. The opposite edge of the steel rule features divisions twice as fine, in sixty-fourths of an inch. The major divisions are still in one-eighth of an inch increments, However, they're now labeled 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48, and 56, 64 Each major division is now broken into eight smaller divisions, each equal to 1 64th of an inch. This steel rule is higher contrast and a little bit easier to read. It features divisions of 1 16th of an inch along this edge, and divisions of 1 64th of an inch along this edge. The major divisions are one-eighth of an inch along the sixty-fourths edge, each major division being broken into eight minor divisions. On this edge, the major divisions of one-eighth of an inch are broken into small divisions of one-sixteenth of an inch. There are two small divisions for each major division. 
This edge of the steel rule is easy to read, featuring only major divisions in increments of one eighth of an inch. Notice there are eight equal spaces between the seven and eight inch marks. Let's take a measurement of a part. For this part, we'll use the side of the rule with the eighth inch graduations. Sometimes it's advantageous to start the part at a whole inch measurement somewhere down the length of the steel rule, rather than starting at the end of the steel rule, which may be damaged or inaccurate. We're starting at the three inch mark. The end of the piece comes up past the six inch mark at approximately five eighths. So if we take the measurement of six and five eighths and subtract the measurement of three inches where we started, the part measures three and five eighths inches in length. We can measure this piece using a decimal scale. We'll start at the four inch mark for convenience. The other edge of the piece comes up past the seven inch mark to six tenths or 7.6. So this piece measures a total of 3.6 inches in length. Let's measure this part using the 1 16th scale. We'll start at the eight inch mark for convenience. The part is wider than one inch, so we go past the nine inch mark and find the line that closely aligns to the edge of the part. We're one increment past the 12 16th mark. So in other words, this edge of the part lands at 13 sixteenths. So with the right hand edge at nine and 13 sixteenths and the left hand edge at eight inches, we determine the part to be one and 13 sixteenths inches wide. The vernier caliper is a more classical measuring tool that features a sliding scale. With proper use, it can still be quite accurate. This vernier caliper features both inch and centimeter scales. The inch scale on the main beam is broken into increments of 1 16th of an inch. The centimeter scale on the main beam is broken into increments of one millimeter. The sliding scale on the inch portion is broken into increments of one 128th of an inch. The sliding scale on the millimeter portion of the beam is broken into increments of 0 0.05 millimeters. Different vernier calipers may use different scales on their main and sliding beams. Now let's make a measurement of a part. Open the caliper jaws and slide them up until they meet the piece with a light pressure. Notice how the scale on the sliding portion of the caliper from zero to eight one hundred twenty eighths of an inch is equal to one sixteenth of an inch, the smallest increment on the main beam scale. To read a vernier caliper involves a few steps. First, we need to reference the zero on the sliding scale against the marks on the main beam scale. Notice the zero mark is just to the left of the half inch mark on the main beam. It's just to the right of the 7 sixteenths mark. That means that 7 sixteenths is our base measurement. Next, we need to see which of the marks on the sliding portion of the caliper best aligns with a mark on the main beam. Notice many of the marks do not align well. However, the six mark does align very well with a mark on the main beam. That means that we must add six 128ths of an inch to our base measurement of seven sixteenths of an inch. Seven sixteenths plus six 128ths is 62 128ths, or reduced 31 64ths. In decimal, that equates to 0.485 inches. To measure the part in the metric system of units, the process is similar, however it's applied to the lower scales on the caliper beam and slide. Notice how here, the zero mark on the sliding portion of the caliper is located past the one centimeter mark. One centimeter is our base measurement. Also notice how the zero is two millimeters past the one centimeter mark. So 12 millimeters really is our base measurement. The next step is to determine which of the marks on the sliding scale best aligns with the marks on the main beam. While it's very close and sometimes difficult to determine, in this instance, the four mark best aligns with a mark on the main beam. That means that to our base measurement of 12 millimeters, we need to add four times 0 0.05 millimeters, or in other words, our total measurement is 12.2 millimeters. To use the dial caliper, first make sure that the jaws are clear of any debris that would affect the measurement. Close the jaws until they gently touch 
loosen the lock screw beneath the dial gauge and turn the dial gauge until the zero mark aligns with the pointer indicator. Relock the screw. We're now ready to make a measurement. Let's review some main parts of the dial caliper. The main beam, the external measurement jaws, the internal measurement jaws, the depth gauge, the dial, the dial lock screw, the main slide lock screw, and the thumb wheel. Using the thumb wheel, move the caliper jaws in to the piece that you'd like to measure. Apply a light pressure to take the measurement. Let's take a closer look. First, we need to take the measurement from the main beam. This measurement reads 1.1 inches at the main beam. To that, we add a measurement from the dial gauge. The dial gauge reads 25 thousandths, or 0 0.025. Added together, the total measurement is 1.125, or as a fraction, 1 and 1 eighth inch. The outside diameter of this bearing is 1 and 1 eighth inch. To measure interior dimensions, the interior jaws are used. The inside of this bearing measures one half inch in diameter. The inside of this hexagon measures 0 0.503 inches across. The back of the caliper features geometry useful for measuring depths or parts with step features. To take this sort of measurement, start with the caliper open a ways, bring the part up to it, and then slide the movable jaw into the part. The distance we're measuring is from here to here. To make depth measurements, use the depth gauge that extends from the beam of the caliper. Start with the gauge extended and push the main beam into the part to take your measurement. The small portion of the depth gauge is included in the measurement. The digital caliper provides a simple and effective way to make precise measurements. However, it's not as reliable as a dial caliper because it has batteries that can become depleted. Before using the digital caliper, it's important to make sure that it's zeroed with the jaws closed. Measurements can be made in either inches or millimeters. When measurements are complete, return the caliper to its case for safe storage. When measuring the outside of a part to the nearest one thousandth of an inch, the best instrument to use would be a. Steel rule, B. Caliper, C. Depth micrometer. The correct answer is B. Caliper. Calipers measure to one one thousandth of an inch. When a more precise measurement is needed, micrometers can be used. Micrometers come in three types, external, internal, and depth. Let's take a look at each. This micrometer set features micrometers in three different sizes, depending on the size of the component to be measured. The smallest micrometer measures components between zero and one inches. The medium size measures between one and two inches. The largest size micrometer measures between two and three inches. Each micrometer has a precision of one one thousandth of an inch. Also included in the set is an adjustment wrench and two calibration pieces to ensure that the micrometers read accurately. Let's label some parts of the micrometer. The measuring surfaces, the lock, the main scale, the sleeve, and the thimble. With the micrometer closed, the zero mark on the thimble lines up with the zero mark on the sleeve. The pressure required to achieve this alignment is the same amount of pressure that should be used when making measurements. Let's take a look at the scale. Each revolution of the thimble is 25 thousandths of an inch. Similarly, each line that becomes exposed on the sleeve is also 25 thousandths of an inch. The smallest increments on the thimble are each one one half thousandth of an inch. Let's measure the width of this bearing. We'll take a closer look at the measurement between the thimble and sleeve. Using the small ratchet wheel at the end of the micrometer handle is a good way to avoid over tightening. To read the measurement, we first look at the position of the edge of the thimble 
in relation to the graduations on the sleeve. Notice that we have just passed the point 0.3 mark on the sleeve. Point 0.3 is our base measurement. We then need to see which of the marks on the thimble lines up with the zero line on the sleeve. We've passed the 10,000th mark, we've passed the 11,000th mark, we've passed the 12,000th mark, and the next half a thousandth mark lines up with the zero mark on the sleeve. Therefore, we need to add 12 and a half thousandths, or 0 0.0125, to our base measurement of 0 0.3. The total dimension is 0 0.3125. In fraction, that's 5 sixteenths. This micrometer is used to measure inside dimensions ranging from 0.2 to 1.2 inches. Its thimble and sleeve are read in a similar fashion to the other micrometers, however this micrometer also features a counter. Let's measure the inside diameter of this ball bearing. This ball bearing measures 0.375 inches diameter on the inside race. This micrometer set includes pins of many different lengths to precisely measure holes up to 9 inches deep. The depth micrometer is similar in function to the external micrometer, however instead of measurement jaws, it features a pin that extends out a precision ground surface on the bottom. The scale is reversed for measuring the depth of holes. In this video, we learned how to use various types of measuring devices such as steel rules, calipers, and micrometers, including different types of each. With additional practice, you can become proficient in making precise measurements in the machine shop. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.